Like wa come, wa come, wa wake up. <laughs> I can't get that one right to save my life. Even when I get it right, I still think it's wrong. Yeah. Wa come. Wa come. Wa means harmony. Oh, does it? Wa come is computer. Yeah, I was convinced forever it was wake up. Wake up. Yeah, everybody, even the other concept artists are like, no, it's wake up, like you guys. Welcome to Obsessed Show a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Today's episode of Obsessed Show is brought to you by Wacom. I'm pretty sure it's Wacom. No, oh, man, it's Wacom. No, it's Wacom. Pronounce wa like the Japanese word for harmony and kam like computer. The Wacom Cintiq 16 creative pen display and accompanying Pro Pen 2 work in perfect harmony to give you the best in precision, control, and ergonomic comfort. Use the code OBSESSED for 10% off the Cintiq 16 until November 30th, 2019, only at Wacom.com. Let's talk about today's episode. Okay guys, today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with award-winning illustrator and costume concept artist, Gina D. Domenico Flanagan. Her work on many blockbuster films includes Godzilla, Wrinkle in Time, Jumanji, Malcolm X, Escape from LA, The Boys, Hateful Eight, the list goes on and on and on. She works with costume designers to conceptualize and create images of how they want the characters to look. So without further ado, Gina, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hi, thank you, Josh. I'm happy <laughs> to be here. <laughs> how much, In how my close room. was I on getting your name right on the first try there? I got it perfect. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I'll take perfect. Um, so this is a, a question that I love to, to ask all of our guests, which is to tell us about your origin story. But in particular, I'm curious, which was your first passion? Was it, was it the film world and characters or was it illustration in particular? Um, it was illustra- It was just drawing as a kid. Um, it's what I did all the time on everything. It drove my parents crazy. So I just <laughs> had a connection to drawing that I, I didn't realize I had a connection, but as I got older and drew on everything and then went to high school and did all the backdrops for the plays and did the cartoon for school and hated academics. It started to materialize that, that art was a passion of mine or that I I felt comfortable being an artist and getting a lot of like, um, people admired my art and, and, um, what is it? What is it? Um, I got a, uh, I was popular because of my art, but I it didn't mean anything, you know, and, and especially my parents were very academic minded. So to them, it was just cute, mm. but still it felt really good. So how did that manifest itself into costume design? Was there an interest oh. in, in fashion or in the character side of things or in the film side of things? Like how did, how did doing art manifest itself into the career that you're in today? Okay, that's a long, you know, that's a long answer. <laughs> like, like, we but have a little bit of time, That's right? why we're here. Okay. In high school, like I said, I was drawing all the time. And then when it came to um, go to college, I didn't quite know what I was going to do because my grades weren't that good. I loved to draw, but I was also in the theater. So I got into a college that was a great theater school. So I um, I thought I was going to be an actress because I still didn't know anything about art. And my folks, again, didn't ever communicate to me that art could be a career. So um, I went to acting college and did that for two years and hated it and thought the only other thing I can do is draw. So I went to the Academy of Art College in San Francisco and took every class I could take, Uh, graphic design, fashion illustration, photography, just everything to see if I was an artist, if I wanted to explore that thing that always made me feel good as a kid. Um, And I had no other direction. I didn't, I felt lost, but if I had had 
people around me that let me know that that my art was something that was a beautiful thing, I don't think I would have felt lost. But it was kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go to art school. Sorry, sorry, it's what I'm going to do because I don't know what else to do. So in I I spent now I'm in my fifth year fourth year of college, and Frank Rizzo from Parsons School of Design in New York City saw my work. He had come to visit the school and I had been in fashion illustration class and I loved it. And he saw it and said, you have to come to New York. And so I went to New York and I, at that time also, I had financial stability to be able to keep moving schools and this is a complete luxury and I know it, but I had had a small inheritance that got me through all this college. So I moved to New York and started at Parsons School of Design and thought I was going to be a, cost to, um, a fashion illustrator, fashion designer. Still just completely loved drawing, but I thought, okay, I'll design clothes as long as I get to keep drawing. And I graduated and I was hired by Bob Mackey to be an assistant design, his assistant designer in New York. And when he told me what, what I was going to make versus how much the cost of living was in New York. And at that time, then my inheritance had dwindled quite substantially. Um, I decided that I had to move to California because I thought, okay, where can I do this fashion? Where can I be a fashion design assistant? So it was either California or New York at that time. Um, Texas, there was Dallas was kind of happening, but it, it it didn't intrigue me. So I moved to Los Angeles and I got a job with a sportswear company as her assistant designer, Tina Hagen. And I spent a year doing that. And I realized after a year being in the fashion industry and being a design assistant that I couldn't relate to anybody in the fashion industry. It was just a different tribe. They weren't my people. I felt just lonely and I, I just, I didn't make friends and it just, it was. Are we talking like devil wears Prada here or <laughs> what, no. what kind of vibe was it? It was all the people in the workroom. Um, I was, I was costing the groups, which means you take all the patterns, you lay them down on the fabric and you figure out exactly how much it's going to cost to create each pattern at um, each pair of pants, each shirt. And so I was doing really like mechanical things. I was going to the, um, the people who would make the buttons and, and the zippers and I'd go have meetings with them. And mm -hmm. being a design assistant, I think, you know, in school we drew all the time. But in, in the fashion world, we were ordering products and figuring out how much the group cost and, and getting all the products in, making sure they got to the stores. It was being a design assistant meant you drew two weeks out of every six months. And so yeah, it sounds more like logistics and budgeting than, or was, project management almost than exactly, design. exactly. It wasn't, it was, and I realized school was just this fluff. I mean, as much as Parsons school of design was like the greatest school ever. And it gave me access. Even now it gives me access to a lot. Um, it had nothing to do with what the business was. The business wasn't drawing. The business was all, all the minutia of, of it. So um, I thought I can't do this. I, I just, and, and also it was two weeks off a year and, and we had to work all those other days <laughs> <laughs> without a break. And I'm like, wait, now this doesn't work for me either. I'm more free spirited. I sound like a complete pain, but I did find the perfect job. So I quit Tina Hagen after a year and thought, okay, where else can I kind of do what I've been trained to do? And I thought costume design, I'll be a costume designer. So I did my research and found out that to be in the movie industry and to work in costumes, you have to be part of a union. And the union that the costume design category uh, and costume design assistant category was the 892, which is the costume designers guild. So I called the costume designers guild and I said, how do I get in? And they said, well, you've got to have all these credits. You've got to have all these hours. You've got to have all this. So you got to have all that. And, and I had asked, how do you get in as a costume designer? And then they said, or 
if you want to come in as a as a costume illustrator, all you have to do is show us your portfolio. And I was mm. like, what? A portfolio? I mean, like of what? And they said, oh, costumes. I'm like, okay, how many drawings do you need? So I created a portfolio simply to get into the guild because they said once you're in, you can go up. You can, you can elevate from costume illustrator to design assistant to designer. And I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. Because I still didn't know there was a whole job that you could be illustrating all day long every day. Costumes. Yeah. Um, so I got in and I started working because also it, it doesn't just happen like that. This is the process that you probably want to hear about. Um, the Costume Designers Guild has a book and it has an availability um, um, page on the internet so that if you need work, you put your name on the availability list. And if you want to call designers to try to find work, you have a book. They mail you this book with everybody's number in it. So it's, it's, it's really, you have the power to find a job. So basically I got that book and I sent every single designer my resume and said what I could do and showed them an illustration and said, I can work on set and I can work at costumes and I'm willing to do anything. And I got my first job with Ruth Carter who just won the Academy Award. She was one of my first jobs and I was actually doing some illustration for her and it got, it was Meteor Man, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Meteor Man or Boys in the What did she just win the Academy Spider-Man. Award for? She won the Academy Award for Black Panther. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Did you not Man. see it? I I didn't. Well, I, I'm i not really following costume That's... designers per se, what? but uh, I do <laughs> I do admit that um, I did cry during that film. <laughs> Wait, <is laughs> and and I've also wondered, like, especially the... No, it was a good cry. But <laughs> um, especially, like, all the African... Uh, mm. design costumes like mm-hmm. I'm surprised that hasn't made it more into pop culture yet when I saw those I was like that is going to be on the shelves in the That's mall right. like in 18 months That's right. hot topic man right. all that stuff all those necklaces and the cool tops and say so, yeah that's all going to be at hot topic but no I didn't I don't see it either it's just kind of strange so anyhow I totally derailed your question but you know part of the thing is so interesting to me is that um, we haven't had much of anybody on from the film industry since really season one of the show. We've had a lot of graphic designers and mm-hmm. a lot of illustrators, but not, um, you know, folks who are designing and drawing costumes for, mm-hmm. for the film industry. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to me how differently different industries work. You know, we have, um, one of the last illustrators we talked to was talking more about how his agent goes out and gets him work and, you know, this, this whole union thing is kind of mind blowing that you just kind of like, I don't know, sign yourself in that you're available. Yeah. And then, and, then you have and people to get look, work. Yeah. yeah. Designers look at the availability list and they, and we, it's like we're a family and there's, I wish it was bigger, but there's only about a thousand of us um, in the costume designers guild. So it's, it really does feel like family. You know, we all, we have gatherings, we, we lift each other up, we protect each other. Um, it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice. And the union is really healthy. And we have health insurance, we have pension. So I'm an illustrator and I get to draw all day, but I also have health insurance and a pension. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Right. To be an artist and have those kind of things to have solid ground like that is, is as far as I'm concerned. I'm, no. So are there other ways besides um, just sort of signing yourself in as available? Are there other ways that you are able to land these great clients? Is it, is it a relationship thing or is, are, you know, are there other ways that you have to market yourself within the industry? Well, okay. It's a relationship thing. So like, for example, Ruth, Ruth and I started out together how many years ago? And I'm not going to say it, but long time ago, 25 years ago. And now whenever she has a job and she thinks I'm right for it, she'll call me and -hmm. either I can do it or I can't. So I have a client base now. Uh, Even if I started three or four years ago, I'd still have a client base because I'd work for one. And usually our jobs only last like three months. You know, it could be six weeks. It could be three months. It could be a day. We never Mm -hmm. quite know. It could be a year. Um, So we never quite know how long our jobs are, but because 
our jobs usually jump from project to project. We usually have our core list of designers that we work for. And when one needs illustration, the other ones are on set and, and there are, they're now shooting, you know, so they don't need costume illustration anymore. Everything's all been mm. established and made. So, so then by the time that person, and we usually rotate, rotate like four or five designers. So one time, once that person's done, then they're ready for illustration again. And the one we're working for is done. So, so it's easy to kind of rotate around, you know, the months at, um, and, and still be very work consistently, but jump from show to show to show. Do you ever take um, clients on concurrently within the industry? Like, can you be working on two films at the same time or do you work all the way yeah. through on one and then go to the next? We can work multiple. Okay. We could, we could work multiple at one time. It, it's, it's dangerous. You got to make sure that your time management is good. Um, also that your designer is happy and not feeling deprived or, mm. or, or you're missing deadlines because you took too much work, but I could easily work day night on another project and weekend on another project. And sometimes designers will say, I need you for four days and it's okay if you go to another project for the next couple of days and then I'll need you back. You know, it's a little bit crazy making, but it, it happens. It, it, you can do it that way if you want, as long as you keep things straight. Well, I'd love to hear about your actual design process. You know, is this more pen and paper and gouache and watercolor or are you working on the computer and Adobe suite or what, what's kind of your typical process look like? Um, do you want to know the before and after, or yeah. do you want if there's just a before the and now? After, let's talk about that. There's a before and after. Um, my whole, the whole beginning of my career, which is, um, 15, at least 15 years, it was a light board with tons of gouache paints, bristle paper, um, markers, every, every kind of real art supply. Um, and I would go to work. And it was, oh God, it was such a hard setup. And I, cause it's a lot of stuff and I'd set up and I'd illustrate in actual paint. So when, when you were done, you actually had a piece of artwork, at least you had a piece of artwork you could yeah, frame that was cool. on Bristol paper that you could touch and feel. And, and unfortunately in those days, if the designer said, I like it, but can we see it in red? I'd have to start all over again from like getting the likeness. I mean, I was drawing perfect likenesses. Um, so I'd have to start all over again, which is what we did for weeks and weeks and weeks. Then I took a break to have my kids. Um, I actually didn't think I was gonna go back to illustrating. Um, I guess I hadn't thought much about it. I just knew that I had three kids and that that was what I was gonna do. I um, wasn't gonna try to work and, and uh, raise kids. So, um, I ended up when the kids got older going back to work. And when I re-entered the atmosphere, it, the, all the players had changed. All the people that I knew were gone. All the other costume illustrators were gone. Um, and it was young men with their Cintiq and their MacBook Pro and all their computers. And um, they, they, it was all digital. It was all mm. everything, Photoshop and ZBrush. And it was a whole digital world that I walked into. And it was... It was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. And I thought, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. But here I am. I still can't turn my TV <laughs> on, which you know. <laughs> right? Because, you know, I could hardly plug this in. So um, you fully transitioned over to digital then? I fully transitioned. Yes. And then there's that, oh, I transitioned. No. I found a private teacher because I, I went to classes everywhere for computer digital artwork. And there was nothing that taught me what I needed to know for my specific job. I mean, it all skirted the issue and taught me a whole bunch of things I didn't need to know. And um, so I got frustrated and I couldn't, still so couldn't work in the industry. And so I found a private teacher, showed him exactly what I needed. He knew how to get me there. And I took a solid year of private lessons mm. um, to learn how to do my specific craft. And the reason why it's special, well, not the reason why, but it's, it's, it's an unusual craft what I do. There's no class on it because there's only 44 of us in, in, in the union in Los Angeles. And only about 15 of us are, are 
concept, digital concept artists. The other ones are still working with paint and, and paper, but, but the digital art is, is if you want to work on the projects that I want to work on, you have to be a digital artist. You have well, to be. Some of the films that I mentioned at the top of the show, um, like these are, these are not little films. <laughs> no, <laughs> these are really big you. projects. Yeah. Um, I didn't even mention as star is born. Another one I cried at. Yeah. We're just going to talk about all the films that made me cry. Um, those are the ones you worked on. Good cry. Um, but yeah, but good, cry, good cry. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, no, oh, this film is awful. Is I can't take it anymore. Yeah, oh my goodness. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> Welled up just thinking about it. But, but these Aww. are big deals. So like the fact that there's, there's only 15 of you who are doing this craft for digital. Uh, yeah. For digital. That's, that's awesome. That's a pretty, yeah, and that pretty awesome the market to uh, be in. Yeah. So yeah. are you doing the whole, the whole um, Cintiq Wacom thing yourself now? I am. I'm obsessed with them now. Originally, my whole previous life, I was obsessed with gold jewelry. Now it's the Wacom Cintiq. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as good. <laughs> now if it was like, do I want to go to Bulgari or do I want to get another Wacom Cintiq? It'd be like, oh, Cintiq. <laughs> <laughs> I just, and I just, I need one to travel. I need one to go, you know, to short trips. I need the one for long trips. I need the one for my home office. I need the one for my regular office. I need the one for my office in Santa Barbara. Like I need so many of them. I do. They're way up there on the, this pyramid of need. What got one in the car. Got yeah. One, uh, <laughs> one in the car. One for the beach. Yeah. The, it's changed my life. I, I love them dearly. Um, so what was the question you asked me? I just got like all flustered. <laughs> well, if like you I'm had so completely gone to that process of, of drawing directly into the system or if, if it was more, you know, vector base or. No. Okay. So I or, use Photoshop. So, and yeah. because of the Cintiq, it feels like I'm drawing on paper. I mean, it's, it's as close as you can get to, to, um, the original way I drew like I used to draw on a light board and the Cintiq is acts exactly it sits exactly the same I'm drawing I'm I'm what's happening is when I draw it's happening right there unlike the the um pads that you 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 put on down and then you're looking up here and you're drawing down mm -hmm. here there's that eye hand coordination that I didn't have to do that that I don't think I could have done so One I of my creative it, directors did that and I never I never understood how he could do it but it's it's a and he would go curve. back and forth between the mouse and the and, yeah. the, and the pen and was like yeah I, I don't even know what you're doing <laughs> yeah but the this this the Cintiq takes out that learning curve basically you can go right from drawing on paper to drawing with the Cintiq and it it's it doesn't hurt at all. You just have to learn the program, which is, which is learnable. That's super cool. It's a little bit are of there, um, so are there ever films or projects that are, that are bad fits? Like how, how do you, how do you identify a good fit versus bad fit on these? Or, you know, this, is, this is just fit? such a foreign, uh, a foreign world to me that you're kind of like on the bench and available. Yeah, uh, it's not like it's not like you go, or maybe you do. I mean, tell me about how this process works in terms of like, what jobs I choose so, to do. And yeah, so if they say, "Hey, we need you," are you still at liberty to go? Uh, I, I don't actually want that project, or do you take the ones that show up? I have always taken almost every project that shows up. The bad fits aren't what you're drawing. It's it's the family that you walk into, you know, mm, like who's in the mm. office and the, the dynamic that's happening in the office, like any office you would walk into, there's healthy yeah. ones and there's unhealthy ones. And then there's, there's ones that have that energy. That's, that's, that's that tense energy. And then there's the really laid back energy. And so it, it, what I say is every job I take is the first day of school. It always feels like the first day of school. <laughs> and I, I hate it. I hate it. And I always get nervous. Like it's the first day of school and have all my stuff and I don't know who I'm going to meet. And usually I know the designer, but the crew completely changes. So I don't know what the, and I don't know how the designer is going to communicate to me. So some designers communicate so clearly. I do the drawing done. Great. Oh, sorry. Probably hurt. Um, 
it's done. And then there's some that are like, I didn't say zipper down the front. I'm like, right here, it says zipper down the front. No, I didn't mean zipper down the front. I, and you're like back and forth on just something as simple as a zipper. And mm -hmm. there's, there's this lost feeling. And, and, and so it always makes me a little nervous. So I really love my stable of designers that I are, I'm familiar with. And I know how they're going to communicate to me and I know how to make them happy. And I know, I know what they're thinking because I've gotten to know them. So I'm, I'm happiest when I can go to somebody that I'm, I'm familiar, I'm very familiar with. But then again, you know, that's not good too. You got to always be meeting new people and it's just, I don't know, a little bit scary. Sure. I, mm -hmm. I saw in your bio that you'd done some teaching as well. Yes, I teach at UCLA. Okay, um, cool. And you're still, I, you're still teaching currently? No. So yes and no. So I just teach one or two classes um, a year. Um, they bring me in to teach um, um, life drawing. And I basically turn, but it's in the costume department. So I teach life drawing with a twist of who are these people? Where are they? What just happened to them? We create characters. So in, in creating a character in life drawing, it would tell you the mood of the line quality, your line quality and, mm. and the shading and, and what that, how that person looks, how their face looks and how they're standing. And so I don't just say, okay, you know, do a pose and draw it guys, but make it a pretty drawing. It's no, no, no. There's all these other things you have to think about to create a character. And so then we go to dressing the, the models. We start with nudes for the first couple of weeks and then, we start dressing them and I have the kids create characters with the clothing. And so it's really fun. And mm. I love being around young students. I didn't know it until I said yes to teaching. And I was like, Oh God, I have to teach. This is like going to be horrible. And then after a couple of weeks of meeting the students and getting to know them, I, I just couldn't imagine what it's like not being around young people. And you know, they're, they're, they make you young. And I taught Photoshop, I taught Photoshop tw once or twice. I taught, taught Photoshop twice there. And that was the most fun because I'd be teaching and you know, I'm only been doing this for three years and here I am teaching at UCLA. So I have no, you know, I know I'm an imposter. I don't know. I can't, <laughs> I'm teaching them what I do. And that's all I can teach them. Don't ask me about that tool there or that tool there or that tool there. I know my recipe for how to get from here to here and I'll teach that to you. And I thought, okay. And it's good and it's cool and it works at work. So I have something to teach them. So I, I, I'm teaching them that, but I'm still saying, okay, here, we're going to go from A to B here. And they'll be like, um, why are you going, why are you doing it that way? Mm -hmm. Well, mm, because it's the way they're like, no, there's a faster way. I'm like, oh, come here, come here, come on up. And so I'd have the students come up and teach the faster way or the more interesting way or whatever it is. And it would be so fun. And I'd leave class going, I learned so much. <laughs> you know, I've heard it said, especially on technical stuff, if you are, you know, one section or one chapter ahead from the person you're teaching, you're the expert. So as long as you know, just that much more than they do, then, then you're bringing your expertise to bear. Well, I guess, but they kind of knew a lot of steps. They knew a better way to get there. And then some of them were flawed. Some steps were flawed. I'm like, no, no, no. Here's why you can't do it that way. But it was, we were all teaching each other. Of course, I'm the, I taught them the most though, right? <laughs> <Of> <laughs> but it was, we just had fun. And we all, I don't know, it was just, it was a nice time. And, and I got to learn things and it taught me the importance of being around young people who know the cutting edge of what's going on. And it's funny because I have a 16 year old and an 18 year old and a 20 year old. And my 20 year old's already out. She already is like, doesn't know anything. The 16 year old now knows everything and knows how to get around all the apps and, you know, upside down and inside out and DMing and all the stuff that she does. And my 21 year old's like dated. So you have to stay around the young people to, to, be current to, to be current, whether you like it or not in terms of what is going on. Sometimes you hear what's going on. It's like, no, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to. What is that program I have to learn? I don't want to. So, 
So let's imagine it's a day that you're not teaching um, mm. and, and you're in a project. What you kind of described what the fashion industry was like for you. What What's a maybe an average or a typical day in theory look like for you when you're you're working on a film? Okay, so right now I'm working on a whole bunch of um, superhero TV shows. I'm working on Titans, Doom Patrol, Black Lightning, The Boys, and Stargirl. And so I'll go to work. And if I'm starting a new character, the designer will come in and sit and have a meeting with me, who is Laura Jean Shannon. She's fabulous. And I've been, I've been at this job for three years now, which is almost unheard of as an illustrator, but that's because she's got five shows in rotation. So mm. there's never a dull moment. You know, we don't, we don't do the show and then everybody disperses. We're all, so all now of those on shows to the next. are part of the same, the same production team. No different. Oh, the same team, but different producers, but the same okay. team, the gotcha. same team sticks together. And now we Very jump cool. on to the next one, but we get to stay in the same office and all of that. So um, she'll come in, she'll meet with me. She'll describe what she envisions for this character. And then I'll look up the research with her and without her and look at what the character looks like in the comic books. And then um, I'll research who the character is, you know, what, the, what they're all about, what are their powers? Because now I have to decide, okay, so I'm gonna start creating concepts with the research and what the designer wants. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to put that together and make something that can be made in the real world that's not a comic book, but that's current. Because some, some of these costumes are dated, but you still have to honor the fans by making it very, very recognizable and very similar to the comic book. Yeah, that's got to be the balance between, um, you know, all of my, my nerd chill a little bit, but like, you oh. know, Hawkeye in Avengers doesn't look anything like Hawkeye in the comic books looks like. Yeah, and that's a tough thing for the fans to swallow. See, so I, I just, I was a fan. So I grew up reading comic books and um, being obsessed with the X-Men and Miss Marvel. And so I knew that if in a, in a movie or in a TV show, if their story changed or how they became that superhero changed or their costume changed, I'd be gone. Be like, I'm not yeah. watching this. Why would I? That's not who it is. Why would I? And, you know, or if they changed, like if it was a kid and now it's an adult playing that role, it's like, no, that's not who that character is. Mm -hmm. Turn it off. I don't want to see it. So I'm real sensitive about it. So I, it's my job to not only melt that together, those, the two worlds together, but to put it on the character and, and, and the, like, I'll start with a pose. Now the pose has to embody who this is. That's why I have to research who this is, um, how they feel. Like, are they proud? You know, the proud stance versus, versus the, the, the sneaky characters always mm -hmm. like, they're just, you know how we can. So I have to communicate not only the costume, but I communicate with, with the way the pose is. So, and then of course the look on their face and all of that. So I start with basically a nude. Um, and if it's cast, that's even better because then I can put their face on. But usually when I'm on, when, when we start, it's not cast yet. So I'm also guessing about their body, you know, but certain, certain characters have certain kind of bodies. So I, 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 I guess pretty well. So I will then create a pose. And after that's approved, then I'll start drawing on top of the pose, um, just tons and tons and tons of, illust of, of seam lines. And I, I basically illustrate the costume a hundred different ways. And then we take all those images that I create, not out of the blue though, I'm creating these images, I'm putting them all together like a puzzle, but I'm looking at research and I've, I've got the information from the designer. So, so, once the, then we print them all out, we look at them all and we choose favorite elements. And then we hone it down to probably 10 designs and those 10 go to the producer and then they, they weigh in. Um, and then it goes down to five and then it goes down to three and then they 
go into color in three and then we're down to one and we've nailed it. So it could, the process could be two weeks to six months on a design like star girl took us a really, really long time, but she's the lead of the show. And we were very careful, you know, to get exactly what, what the producer wanted. Do you have um, a, a film or character design that you've done that, that you're most proud of, like a, a favorite professional design? Um, no, like I love drawing so much. I love them all. And sometimes the illustration is cooler than the costume. So it's like a love and illustration, but the one people go nuts over the most is galaxy quest, Cirrus in galaxy mm, quest. Okay, I did sure. all the concept art for the bad guy. And that one always gets like, so I, that's another thing. It's like what the fans love too. Oh, that makes fun. a big difference when something that you do that you're like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then people respond to it. They're like, that's amazing. I that's think amazing. That's a, that's yeah, a and- bigger feeling than something you feel good about. And then just nobody, nobody's yeah. really into it. Though sometimes, and most of the time, no one sees my concept art because it's in the workroom. So when I'm done with my concept art, it goes to all the departments and it, it's the communication tool for everything to get built and everybody did understand what this character is going to look like. But when they go to promote the, the costume, there's another artist, a poster artist, that does the costume in the poster style. So I, my work doesn't get seen unless I um, use social media to, mm. to show my art or at Comic-Con. Now, do you ever, uh, um, there's a couple of guys that I've followed on, Instagram for a while that do um, this one guy's handle is boss logic. I don't know if that rings a bell, but um, he does like a lot of when rumors are going around about a certain actor playing a certain role, he'll mock up like what oh. somebody would look like in that. In oh, that that's role. funny. I got, I, I want to follow that person. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll what about him? His, I think he's yeah. in Australia. I, I'm pretty sure that's where he's based, but um, he tends to do a lot of stuff around the, the superhero film stuff, but like, um, you know, when there's rumors about who might be the next James Bond, he'll just do yeah. consecutive posts oh, of different guys in tuxes looking, looking tough. Like, so he like does Bond. artwork. It's like, no, mm-hmm. that, yeah, that very, very fun. Photoshop heavy. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, maybe you dig it. I'll, I'll send you his okay. info and we will, we'll link to him in the show notes. So other people can, can check that we'll out. Take a well. look at that. Um, so Instagram's a good place to check out your stuff as well. Yeah, Instagram. I'm I'm pretty slow to post, but um, it's only because it's everything I do is a secret, and so it takes forever for me to be able to release something to get clearances to release. Even even if it's like Star Girl poster art was done, but I can't really show the costume illustration art. It's you know I sign non disclosure agreements, and it's very serious. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's scary too because the fans are always looking for for you know something in the picture behind me and right. it's happened and it was Leaks a really bad day. <laughs> it's a very right. very bad day. We'll pick and that it, stuff and, apart. Yeah, and you forget like what the important things are in life when there's a leak and it's your fault. But um, <laughs> especially with this comic book stuff, which I get because I'm a comic book fan, but. It's still, oh God, they're, re- they're always looking like they'll zoom in on a little address on your desk. So mm-hmm. I'm glad we're not at my office right now. Thank God. <laughs> right. We may nothing, have to nothing back put the, there. the blur filter around the outside oh. just to, <laughs> just in case there's something in your, in your house. <laughs> no, um, so something that I've found with all the designers that we've interviewed, and this is a question we've asked everybody is that we find that designers are often a very obsessed or obsessive group. Um, so I'm curious whether it's in design or life or illustration or technology or comic books, what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. The Cintiq. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of my career? Yeah, it could be anything really. I'm going to, 
I, 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 that was a true answer. I, it's the Cintiq. I want a really big one now. I just, I want every size and I want a big one and want to know what it feels like to have that arm where I can maybe stand up and draw. Cause we sit for 14 hours easily. I sit for 14 hours or I'll, I'll do an all day, 12 hour day. And then I'll drive home, which takes an hour. And then I'll do a second job till midnight. So I'm sitting that whole time. So I've got to figure out a way to, and I want to try that. They, they have this fabulous ergonomic, what is the word? Ergo. Ergonomic. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, arm that like <laughs> maybe I can like lift it up and stand up. And now it's all, it's, it's, I'm obsessed with this antique. So sad. Awesome. Great question. <laughs> Great answer. Um, so I'm also curious, um, if you Can have, or something? <laughs> well, be with maybe, maybe if we do a, an episode two, we can, <laughs> yeah. you can work on that, Move on, world but okay. I'm also obsessed with world peace. Yeah. Now, I'm curious if there is like a dream project or dream character or dream series that you are just dying to create for. Okay. Because I was a Marvel fan, everything that I read was Marvel. Marvel, what to work for Marvel was the pie in the sky for me. It was for a long time. And now that I'm on year three, working on all DC projects, DC was like pff, DC, you know, Marvel, Marvel's like the X Men and all, all, you know, New Mutants and all the things I read. Um, I didn't much read any DC. My brother did, but but I didn't. And so Marvel was always like, yeah, was was the end game for me. It's like mm -hmm. once I work for Marvel, I can die. Everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but now, like I've had little nibbles of people wanting to know if I if 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 there's you know project here, project there that are Marvel projects, and I think I'm I'm not going anywhere. I can't. This is just I'm in one of those places where. I'm just getting to do really fun characters, really cool superheroes. And I'm, I have a lot of freedom and the designer I absolutely adore. And the office is, is a healthy office. It's like, I can't go anywhere. I can't. Yeah. So oh, I'm awesome. where I want to be right now. Exactly where I want to be. Any DC characters that you um, haven't worked on yet that you're just hoping they'll either bring to the big screen or, or bring back? Um, well, Kitty Pride was my favorite character in the X-Men and I haven't seen her ever show up. So mm. that would be, that'd be cool. Jean Grey was my favorite. And one of, and I was just learning the computer when one of the other concept artists was illustrating Jean Grey for, for the X-Men. And I walked into the office that he was working in and saw him working on it and thought, oh my God, oh my God, he's working on Jean Grey. She who is Phoenix and Dark mm -hmm. Phoenix. And um, it just killed me. I thought oh, it's gone. I'll never be able to work on her, but he's one of my best friends. So it was okay. If you can't do it, at least one of your best friends should do it. Um, so mm, did I answer that question? Yeah, no, I think so. Okay. Um, what's your maybe favorite piece of advice that you've received or your favorite piece of advice to give out to your students? Okay. My favorite, favorite advice that I received was when I was, when I had little children, I was freaking out about working, like losing, you know, losing ground, losing my, my career status and all that. And a designer said to me, it was one of the last people I worked for before I just gave up and stopped trying to work and have a baby and be pregnant and have a little one. Uh, she said, there's all, all the time in the world to work. So stop and raise your children now. And I thought, okay. And she was right. So right. Um, and the other piece of advice is don't ever think that you have the luxury of, of not learning the next thing. Hmm. You are never done ever. Don't, don't ever get comfortable and think I got this. Oh, I got all the new stuff. And I knew the no, I now I know the new program and I'm good. You're not good because tomorrow you're outdated. It's done. You're like a dinosaur already tomorrow. And if you kind of get over that feeling of always being behind, it's like, that's one reason why I can't wear one of those, those, those step things that have the steps. Oh, like right. every, every day I wake up to empty again. 
It's like, but I did those steps. <laughs> and it's just a reminder that I have to start all over again. It makes me crazy, but it's kind of that. It's, you, you're not done. It's today's I gave you steps. Day. Where did you put them? <laughs> What'd you do with my steps? Where's my 10,000 steps? Yeah. So those are, those are both really good pieces of advice. Um, Gina, before we let you go today, I know we mentioned Instagram. Is there anywhere else that our listeners could connect with you or see more of your work or find you online? They can find me at IMDb, IMDb Pro, IMDb, but um, mostly it's Instagrams. Yeah. Instagram is it. Cool. Well, we will definitely link to both of those places in the show notes. And this was really interesting talking to our first ever costume design and character designer. This was very cool. Costume concept artist. Costume concept artist. I'm sure I I knew I'd get something, something wrong. We have to be very careful because in, in my business, you have to be the designer, the concept artist, the assistant designer. It's all to be concept artist awesome well, we'll make sure that is totally correct in the show notes and in the okay. title but gina it was a pleasure talking to you and uh yeah. thank you for being on the show and thank you for being obsessed with design totally. thank you another special thank you to wacom for sponsoring today's episode Use the code OBSESSED for 10% off the Cintiq 16 until November 30th, 2019, only at Wacom.com. To find out how your brand or company can get involved with Obsessed Show, head over to ObsessedShow.com and drop us a line. And for those of you who are still listening, you are the obsessed of the obsessed. And if you'd like to support what's going on here at Obsessed Show, I would love it if you would check out patreon.com slash Josh Miles and see if you'd like to kick in a few bucks an episode. It would mean a ton to me. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. You can get all of today's show notes on our website, still at obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show met its fair share of interesting characters at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Visit milesherndon.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.